Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we explore California's history of and relationship to fire. In particular, how Native populations worked with fire and how colonizers from Europe suppressed and prohibited cultural fire management with what we now know are devastating consequences. Over the past four years, the Golden State has battled ever more massive and destructive wildfires, prompting many to call out the importance of managing the land in a different way and looking to Native tribes for answers. My guests are Rick O'Rourke, member of the Iraq tribe, traditional fire practitioner, and fire and fuels coordinator and project coordinator with the Cultural Fire Management Council. Lania Quinn Davidson, area fire advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension and director of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, and Steve Pine, emeritus professor from Arizona State University, author and fire historian. I'd like to start with Rick, the concept of cultural fire management, what cultural fire management means to the tribes. What cultural fire means to us is taking responsibility and managing our land and trying to create and keep the balance of our of our world, reclaiming our uh, prairies, um, our cultural resources, uh, fuel reductions, obviously, and just to keep a safe and a pristine environment, cleaning up our water systems, uh, you know, sequestering carbon. There's just so much to it, removing invasives and it, it's huge. It, it's there's so much. I come from the perspective that fire is scary and dangerous. You know, it also warms you, right? And it cooks your food. So there's that. But to think about this larger perspective or different perspective that fire can actually be healing and it can it can provide all of these benefits to the land. Lania, over the course of the 20th century, how California, what our official relationship to fire has been and how that has impacted the land. What we've seen in, you know, in the 20th century and now in the last 20 years is a real kind of roller coaster with fire, people using fire. We went from a place where a lot of different types of groups were using fire in California in the early 1900s, including tribes and ranchers and to a place where we were using very little fire and really departing from that cultural connection with fire in California in the middle of the the 20th century. And then getting to a point where we wanted to reclaim that connection and and having that largely be coming out of the the federal agencies in the, you know, in the late 1900s where the, the National Park Service, the Forest Service started using fire more, but really kind of kept the average people and the tribes, the folks who were the original users of fire were kept out of that conversation. And it's only recently that we're starting to see that connection come back. And that's the thing that I'm really excited about and that I work on is bringing fire back to the people and you know, trying to rebuild that culture of fire. Steve, now I know you, you study fire history in, in various different regions of the world. Is California... And its history, has that been replicated anywhere else, or was this just a very unique situation? California is not unique. Wallace Stegner once had a great observation about California. He said it was like the rest of the country, only more so. And that, that's true for California's fire history as well. Several things come together. We've got uh, European imperialism. Uh, we've got a uh, state of science. There was really no science of fire in the 19th century, but it was still used to dismiss uh, all kinds of traditional knowledge. This played out throughout Europe's imperium, including uh, settler colonies like Australia, the United States, New Zealand, uh, and so forth. But it's also important, uh, an important point here is that it wasn't just indigenous knowledge, it was traditional knowledge. Europe had a lot of traditional knowledge. Um, All of Europe was was burned routinely, but it was burned mostly within an agricultural matrix. It had very deep traditions, uh, knowledge of burning, and that was dismissed as well. The burning in much of the southeastern United States was so bizarre to people who had been trained in scientific forestry. At one point, they actually hired a psychologist to try to understand why these people had all these irrational beliefs about what fire could do. And the people, the locals, had traditions and they knew how it worked. They got fire on the land in a way that made sense to them. They couldn't explain it in a way that elites found legible. And so it was dismissed as irrational. European intellectuals were very clear that if you used fire, you were primitive. That's the boundary. 
And if you find alternatives to fire, then you are modern, you are scientific, you are rational. So this could be projected more powerfully out in places like India, Australia, Africa, with generally disastrous results. This is the case where the elites in science got it completely wrong. And that fascinates me. It seems as if the priority was, again, suppression or dismissing rather than holistically thinking about how we can maybe partner or listen or learn from. So, Rick, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about the shift in thinking uh, that the U.S. Forest Service in the late 20th century decided because it saw the consequences of its actions over the hundred previous years. Oh, wow, we're not seeing new giant sequoias. We're not seeing the growth we thought. Um, and we're going to go ahead and look at this fire thing again. You want to work hand in hand, but there's always the concern about, uh, as Lenya said, leaving the native populations out of the conversation. I'm curious from your perspective, how that conversation has been going and what the tribes want. Let me first say that we're not a part of the established Yurok uh, government. We started our own company so that we can uh, pursue reclaiming our right to use fire as a land management tool. It's been going really good working with the agencies and creating a trust relationship to where we can collectively get together and apply fire in a positive way to our landscape. And working with so many different agencies, both from America and abroad, and naturally in the state of our lands right now, we can't just go out and start burning. We have to come in with the fire crew to get our lands into a place where we can start applying fire and, as you said earlier, put the fire back into the hands of the people. We do trainings and we do uh, workshops with the community and we invite them in for input. We want to show them a different application of fire in a more of a spiritual context and the connection with the land that it develops. Because as I apply fire, to me, it's, I'm applying prayer. And, and, and that's a huge part of, of who we are as Yurok people. Our first agreement with our creator to be where we're at is to take care of our land. And the creator brought us fire and showed us how to use it in a proper fashion to keep the shrubs down, to keep our prairies open, to keep keep furs from encroaching, to keep our water systems pristine, habitat for our animals, uh, cultural resources for our baskets, which is one of the hugest part of our culture because we carry our medicine and our food and our babies in our baskets. And those baskets last for hundreds and hundreds of years. As we started running out of our materials, my Aunt Margot uh, Robbins, who is a, a director of our uh, Cultural Fire Management Council, started up our group. And it started just for basket materials, but it has escalated into this huge endeavor to help repair our lands. Wow, that is amazing. And can you say a little bit, um, Lenya, I'm going to come to you next about that cultural fire management relationship. But before I do that, I want to ask Rick, can you explain a little bit about how fire can do so much healing, how it can affect the water and the vegetation you use to make plants, how it can help animals. As you know, that the oaks uh, leave quite a bit of leaf litter annually. And as our water seeps through those leaves, it's gathering up those tannins and it's putting those into our water system and raising the alkali levels, which is a major breeding ground for uh, E. coli, all of these huge health risks to us. And as we go through and we burn off the, the ground litter, we're sequestering carbon into the ground, which is neutralizing the pH in our systems, which is going to drop the alkali levels and create a uh, more pure water source. The Yurok people, we're fire adapted, and so is our landscape, which it has happened over thousands and thousands of years. For instance, our hazel, it needs to be burned off so we can get those long, straight, you know, really strong tinsel strength shoots to create our basketry basically our food securities for our grazing animals and, you know, food for our predators so they don't have to come down and, and mess with us. Just a better environment. We need the land as much as the land needs us to keep it in this state of a good, pure, clean 
environment. I want to ask how you've kept the knowledge alive. But before I do that, I want to come over to Lania and talk a little bit about the relationships between all of the parties involved and how you how you're helping to manage uh, that and, and in educate the people who are trying to shift the thinking around California and fires? The formation of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council was a huge step, I think, toward people working together on prescribed fire issues. We formed the Prescribed Fire Council in 2009. You know, before that time, California really didn't have a venue for different agencies and tribes and organizations to come together and talk about prescribed fire explicitly. Prescribed fire councils are really common in the southeastern U.S. where there is a really strong prescribed fire culture. Um, And we had to import that here to California. The surprising part about it, I think, was um, people from all corners of the state coming out. We started that group as a northwestern California prescribed fire council. And after our first meeting, we quickly scaled up to be all of Northern California because so many people came out of the woodwork um, wanting this kind of opportunity to, to work together. And so the collaboration that that, that that group has fostered in California over the last decade has been pretty remarkable. Um, we brought the prescribed fire training exchanges to California in partnership with the Nature Conservancy, um, which was a huge step in the, in the right direction toward building capacity for prescribed fire and training people um, and also building the you know, the organizational agreements and infrastructure for collaboration and for cooperative burning, which is what we need. We need more people working together and more people burning together to to really get to any kind of meaningful scale. Um, We also have done a lot of policy work. So some of the neat things that are happening right now in the legislative world in California um, are an outcome of that kind of collaboration. It will mean some liability sh- protection and liability sharing around prescribed fire, which we never really thought we would see that in California. So we're headed in the right direction as far as cooperating more and collaborating more on this topic. That's amazing. And that leads to a question. Lania, maybe if you could start and Steve, I would love you to jump in. But the idea of how the landscape in California has changed with regard to people moving into the forest. Lots of people are building nice houses in these very fire prone areas that have become even more fire prone with our history of colonizing land management. You, know, you talk about the liability protection and the policies that are coming out in California. How is that being talked about or addressed? From a prescribed fire perspective, development in the wildland urban interface definitely complicates burn planning and burn implementation. But one thing I do like to remind people of is that the places in our country that have the most successful prescribed fire programs, like Florida, are very populated and have people all mixed in to their wildland areas. So I think actually in California, we have huge opportunity because we have a lot of wildland areas that don't have people in them where we could easily reintroduce fire. So I always joke that one of my pet peeves is um, people have all these impediments to prescribe fire that they list off like liability and like urban development. And um, at the end of the day, we have to learn to be creative and figure out ways to get around those things. And we can, and we need to to be looking outside of California for inspiration. You know, I think that's a great point. And I think that comes from sort of a societal, uh, I don't think it's just fire, right? I think we're always worried about liability. I think now is the moment to get creative in so many ways. Steve, I'm wondering if you can address any of that issue, either how California's population has changed or the impact of the fire suppression. Like what really did that do to us as a state? Lots of things. A century ago, uh, California was still the heartland for the light burning controversy, which, which was an attempt openly to emulate what the American Indian was doing and build the entire forest policy on that. Northern California in particular was where this was being fought out. But since then, lots has changed and California has gone uh, into a a world-class suppression model. You know, if you start a fire story in Florida, uh, it always ends with prescribed burning. You start a fire story in California and it doesn't matter where or what your intentions are, it ends with suppression. And I think there are some historical reasons for that. They largely have to do with first the squelching of the light burning controversy that was dismissed. And then essentially World War II, uh, the California Department of Forestry, which actually began as a land management agency, was put on a wartime footing. And in effect, it went to war and it's never stood down. 
And now we've got basically with CAL FIRE, an urban fire service model out in the woods, which is wholly inappropriate. It's a great model for fighting fire in a built environment. It is not a model for land management. And making that conversion is extremely difficult because you have, you know, 80 years or so of institutional pressure pushing you the other way. California can recover its own history and go back to it, but there are great pressures against it. You're going to have to agree what you want the land to be. I mean, we're in a culture now where if you don't like the outcome, you just say no. There's no way to compel people uh, to come to agreement. The political process, which, which ultimately must come to bear here, doesn't seem to be working. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We're talking about cultural fire management. My guests are Rick O'Rourke, Lania Quinn-Davidson, and Steve Pine. There's a lot of opportunity I think we aren't looking at in California. People talk about prescribed fire in the context of climate change. And I saw a fire person posted on Twitter that our our opportunities for burning are going to go away with climate change because it's too hot and dry. And I said, absolutely the opposite. Um, I see so many new windows of opportunity because we have drier winters and I personally love burning in the winter. I think we can do some great work in California that's low risk and really effective in the winter. And so I think we need to expand our thinking around prescribed fire and about what our opportunities look like and and who gets to be part of it. One of the interesting things that I see in our current um, culture around fire in the West is that we really have a culture of fire suppression and that that culture of fire suppression owns prescribed fire. You know, it's one of the reasons, like you said, Steve, that we haven't been able to make progress around prescribed fire is because there's all that ownership of it and not a lot of room for for co-ownership. And so I've been working to really release the hold that the experts have on on prescribed fire and, and say, you know, this was actually a practice that did not come from the fire suppression world. And, and we need to, you know, you guys need to let it go and let us have it back. On that note, Rick, you know, you have the tribal knowledge and history and cultural knowledge. And we are all living in this moment where, as, as Steve so eloquently put it, we're having a hard time working together. We're having a hard time agreeing on anything. Your tribe and the native peoples of this land have a solution that seemed to have worked for, for you know, eons and need to have a voice in this conversation. So what's your perspective on how you would like to see this move forward? Um, one of the biggest things that we really need to do is create our trust relationships to where we can actually get out there, work together, share these knowledge with uh, our state, local, and federal agencies, and come up with a cohesive plan to where we can all work together to apply fire in the proper way. We're looking at getting our landscape back with our native plants. As I approach a unit, I try to, you know, see it a couple of hundred years ago as what it used to be to where I can come up with a plan to get it to where in another couple of hundred years, it will, you know, start going back to what it was. We share that knowledge with other indigenous peoples and helping them reclaim their right to use fire as a land management tool is um, one of our goals. Um, we started a uh, indigenous peoples burn network from uh, our three tribes, the Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk. We're all neighboring tribes. And we've come up with uh, a list of problems and then a list of solutions. And then there's the multi-generational transfers of knowledge looking to the future because, I mean, the job I have is way outside of my lifespan. So, you know, I'm going to need some youngsters to come in and show them to pick up that torch, as it were. Fire is a keystone element. And it's one of the elements that's been missing out of our medicine circle for a while, as, as where fire coincides with some of our ceremonies to keep our balance in the physical and in our spiritual world. And that was a question I had for you, Rick, is how did the knowledge get passed on? And, and I, I know that it gets passed on through oral tradition. However, there was such a decimation of knowledge and of people. I'm a Trinity Unified School District, which encompasses all three tribes, Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk. 
I work with the schools and I go and I talk with the uh, kids about what fire means to us. And uh, then I'll do some science projects with them and give them a scenario and they'll fill it out and then we'll go out and then I'll make up some fire models and then we'll apply fire and, and see if their thoughts were correct. And then we explain why they were correct or why they weren't, help them share knowledge in that way. Um, we also have uh, students come out when we're burning, actually with fire on the ground, and they'll observe from safe distance, and you could see it take hold in their in their brain, and they start to think about it in, in a good way. Like I said, fire has the right to exist. I believe that fire has memory, and our earth has memory, and fire knows where it's been in the historical fires. The big footprints usually are in the same place. If we can help manage that, and so when it goes back to where it knows, if it goes there in a good way, if we keep our land and our water healthy, our people will be healthy. I'd like to build on a point you've, you and, and Melinda and Rick have been developing, though, and that's about the importance of a fire culture. If you have a working fire culture, you will get fire on the ground in the right way. If you don't, it doesn't matter how much technology, how much equipment, how much science, how much money you've got, you're not. That is the critical ingredient. We now have a population, most of which lives in cities, in an industrial context. Uh, fire has disappeared from daily life. They have no experience of it. They only see it on screens. It's not part of their uh, rural economy. Uh, you know, at my university, students can't even have candles in their dorms. Any open flame is prohibited. Well, okay, in cities, I don't really want flames running down the streets. But projecting that, that's not a, the basis for a fire culture for managing land and getting fire on the land. And that has to be recovered. And in places, I'm sorry to say like California, where it was extinguished almost a century ago, it's very hard to rebuild. Some parts of the country, we've got, we've got working fire cultures, it goes fine. California is going to be really tough, but you don't have to get the whole state. You know, you can start picking off patches that work and build from there. So Lania, so given that, how do you think it's going here in Northern California? Yeah, well, I just love that, Steve. I couldn't agree with you more. And the work that I do, I think we should be explicit about the fact that we are not just working on prescribed fire or working on fire management. We are working on culture change and that we need to own that and say it and be proud of that because um, that is the work we're doing. We're, we're community organizers. We're activists in some way and we're trying to rebuild culture and it's really exciting. <laughs> I think there are some points of light in California right now where um, you know in the last couple of years we brought the prescribed burn association model back to California and we're seeing a lot of energy and excitement at the community level that's really grassroots and outside of the agencies and we started the Humboldt County Prescribed Burn Association in 2018 so just a couple years ago and had so much momentum around it community members landowners anyone who wants to be involved and all these other places and reaching out wanting to do the same thing just in two years we now have 12 different prescribed burn association groups across the state of california who are community-based and are actually getting burns accomplished it is just spread this idea you know that people could reconnect with fire has spread so quickly. So I do feel inspired right now. And I feel like California is hungry to rebuild that culture. And um, I think there's just a certain amount of tension there. And I like to call it creative tension, <laughs> because it's forcing us to, to think outside the box and to form new partnerships. But there is tension with that kind of expert driven model, right? Because there's some comfort with the idea that normal people would be able to use fire. And so that's the culture change work we're doing. And it's really cool. So in service of that uh, culture change effort, Rick, what do you want people to know who are disconnected from this process, from this cultural aspect, and maybe even a little bit afraid, uh, thinking that a prescribed burn can get out of control? It reminds me of uh, burning at this uh, gal's house. Uh, we did a lot of treatment, five acres. They had a huge uh, snowfall. They had like a thousand trees fall. And we went through, we cleaned it out. And as I was talking about fire, I could see the animosity in, in her and almost fear. I said, you know, hey, you want me to show you what we're going to do? So I go and I clear around the house. 
when pe- most people hear fire, they see like a freight train running at them, right? And I showed her these these flame lakes that are maybe one to two feet tall, burning away from their house, removing fuels between them and the fire. And then I see her comfort level just raise. And she says, that's not at all what I expected. And that's what I want to show people is that fire isn't this freight train running at them. It's a small fire backing away from them. And, and creating life instead of taking it. It's a better module than waiting for a wildfire to come in. Um, as far as the smoke goes, I mean, we're going to get smoke. Obviously, we're getting smoke now, and this is not on our terms. When we prescribe burn, the smoke is on our terms. It's a low-level, low-intensity smoke that is filtering through our canopy, sequestering minute particles of ash, which contain the lye, which is making our forests more bug-resilient. It's fire hardening our trees and creating a fire adapted uh, landscape. And that's kind of the teaching that I want to transfer to people is that it's not a beast. Uh, It can be, but if treated properly and done in the right aspect, it can be a very, very beneficial fire. And almost in the sense is if we if we don't manage it, then it turns into more of a beast. You know, they, these lightning caused fires that we had recently, we would have had them, but maybe would have gone a little differently had we been doing more cultural management. Absolutely right. Since we're in a day and age when we're having these big fires, it's also given us a chance to manage those fire footprints so they don't get back into that scope. Thank you. Any last words that you think it's important for people to know? Uh, Steve, let me start with you. Most of us now live in a world shaped by uh, burning fossil fuels. We live in industrial combustion, and we don't really understand what fire in living landscapes is like. We don't have a personal connection to it. And getting that through demonstrations, uh, stories, whatever, is, is really critical. We'll know we've succeeded when Hollywood does a big feature film in which prescribed fire replaces the firefighter. Uh-huh. And there are no smoke jumpers. Awesome. That 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 for me is the marker. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Lania. I loved what Rick said about increasing people's comfort. And I think that's a key ingredient to to the cultural piece that we were talking about is is you know gaining comfort with fire. And so I would just encourage the listeners to to reach out and get involved. We do have a website calpba.org that has information about prescribed burn associations and about prescribed fire in general, and then can link you to the local groups that are forming your areas. Um, there's such power in fire and getting that connection is, um, is, is huge. It can be transformative for people. So thank you. Rick. I think that people just need to get informed and uh, we do a lot of community outreach and just try to teach people that there is good fire and the application of it upon your landscape can be extremely beneficial and rewarding as well. It's been life-changing for me, actually. To be involved and educate yourself is huge. And as Lainey said, if you don't want to participate, just the knowledge is comforting that the people that are applying it have the knowledge and, and the skill set to pull this off and we can help create a better world. Thank you to my guests, Rick O'Rourke, member of the Yurok Tribe, traditional fire practitioner and fire and fuels coordinator and project coordinator with the Cultural Fire Management Council. Lania Quinn Davidson, area fire advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension and director of the Northern California Prescribed Fire Council, and Steve Pine, emeritus professor from Arizona State University, author and fire historian. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening.